We're so excited to have you here. And Sharon and Connor, right away, we would love to turn the microphone over to you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, we are happy to have candidates running from District 7 and District 10. These forms are designed for you from the comfort of your home. We want to thank the Arc of Northern Virginia, the Autism Society of Northern Virginia, Web Up Virginia, Resources for Independent Living, Billion Strong, and Dependence Center of Northern Virginia, Disability Resource Center, the Arc of Greater Prince William Insight Inc., Virginia Board for People with Disabilities Training Alumni Association, and very special thanks to CRI for supplying the interpreters. Also, a thank you to each and every one of you watching live now or watching it taped at a later date. Now, I am proud to introduce my son, Connor, who will say a few words on the logistics and then the amazing Lucy Beadmill, who is our moderator for 90 Minutes. My name is Connor Cummings. I am a self-advocate and proud to be autistic. Please remember that this is a sensory-friendly forum. This is not a debate. Talk about what you can do and have done for all individuals and all families with all disabilities. Please do, please do not speak bad about each other. Speak good about yourself. Share your disability experiences and plans if elected. Please remember to concentrate only on you. Let the other candidates concentrate, focus, and concentrate on themselves while you talk all about you. No speaking at the same time or interrupting each other. No raised voices whatsoever. Thank you for respecting the sensory friendly instructions. This is your opportunity to answer our questions and to hear our stories, not just today, but every day you are in office. To all of you watching out there, these candidates are here because they truly care. Thank you so much for being here to respectfully listen to all candidates. This is our opportunity to hear our disability platform to help assure that the representatives include us in their decision-making, not just mentioned, but the seat at the table. November 8th or prior, you can vote for the candidates you feel is best for your needs and supports. Remember to always vote, our, because our voice matters. You can get accommodations to vote, if that helps you, that is. I always have my, besides, I always have my mom with me when I vote. Reach out to Lucy if you have any questions or problems. Each and every one of our, remember, each and every one of our votes counts. Listen and pick the candidate that you think is best and vote for them. Now here is Lucy to start the questions. Take it away, Lucy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Connor. We are elated to have the candidates here with us tonight, as Sharon said, representing Virginia's 7th and 10th district. As a reminder to folks, we'll run this like we usually do, where every question we ask gets asked to each candidate, and each candidate gets equal time. We ask the candidates take about two minutes per question, but we won't be time near cutting anybody off. That's definitely not sensory friendly. So we'll make sure that each candidate has a chance to introduce themselves and we'll maintain that order but rotates who starts. So first we'll give introductory time to the seventh district, first representative Spanberger, then challenger and candidate, Yesley Vega. Then we'll move on to the 10th district, first with an introduction from representative Jennifer Weston, then candidate Hung Kao. Then for the next question, we'll start with Yesley Vega and go on in the order from there and wrap around. So each one will have a chance to go first in the hot seat, second, third, and fourth. As we wrap up today, I'll try and keep an eye on the clock and about how long it's taking us to answer each question. As we get closer to our end time of 7.30, which we intend to honor, we'll make sure we give all of our candidates a chance to do a final wrap up 
that's a chance for them to share any closing remarks or general statements or to speak to any questions we didn't have a chance to answer tonight. As a reminder, all of our candidates were sent some questions in advance of tonight, but we also know people from our audience are live chatting in questions and have emailed us a great number. So there are many things to talk about tonight. We'll get to everything that we can. As a reminder, if you sent in a question, I will do my best to get it asked tonight, but we've got some great minds in the room and lots of things to discuss. So we may not get to it all. We will send the candidates a written version of every question that came into us that is related to disability policy, which is the purpose of tonight's forum. So if you don't hear your question asked live, fear not, the candidates absolutely will still be hearing from you and will know that those issues are important to you. So without further ado, first, we'll turn things over to Representative Spanberger for an introduction. And in everyone's introduction, we'll ask them to take a moment to share who they are and a little bit about their background in the disability community, and that can be personal or professional. And after that round, we'll turn on to our substantive questions. Representative Spanberger, please take it away. Hello, thank you so much for the opportunity to join everyone this evening. My name is Abigail Spanberger, and I am proud to represent Virginia's seventh district in Congress. I was first elected in 2018. I'm also a mother of three school-aged children, um, and I have family members and loved ones uh, with disabilities and challenges. And so I want to thank the ARC of Northern Virginia and the Autism Society of Northern Virginia for hosting tonight's event. I thank you for your continued work on behalf of Virginians uh, with disabilities and challenges. And I want to take a moment to recognize Sharon and Connor. Um, thank you uh, through my work in Congress. I've had the privilege of getting to know you both, and I thank you for your continued advocacy. Connor, you must be so proud of your mother because I know she is so proud of you. Thank you for continuing to walk the halls of Congress uh, and the State House and continuing to advocate for things that matter, not just to you and your family, but to families across Virginia and the country. Um, as everyone watching knows, more than 30 years ago, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act to make sure that all Americans, all individuals with disabilities are guaranteed certain fundamental rights, equal opportunity, independent living, full participation in our communities, and economic self-sufficiency. And in the U.S. House, I have been committed to advancing legislation that will help people realize the rights and protections under the ADA. I also know that we must remain very vigilant to protect these hard-earned civil rights, um, efforts to cut Medicaid, repeal the Affordable Care Act, and gut reasonable accommodation requirements and other legal protections would undermine the promise of the ADA. I will always push back against these proposals because we cannot go backwards and reverse decades of hard-fought gains. By contrast, in Congress, I have worked to provide the support so that so many Virginians need uh, or to provide the support that so many Virginians need in order to realize the promises of the ADA. And I have staunchly supported early intervention programs, including through additional funding provided through the American Rescue Plan. And right now in our Commonwealth, uh, we are using this investment to support a rebound in child count numbers um, and in meeting other needs, such as equipment to support telehealth services, as well as efforts to recruit and retain personnel. The American Rescue Plan also provided states with a 10% boost in funding to Medicaid for home and community-based services. And I was so glad to see that the General Assembly used this fund, these funds to provide bonuses to home health aides and behavioral health providers. These are some examples of how we can make smart, responsible investments in our neighbors that ultimately will make Virginia stronger. And we also must recognize that the disability community has suffered disproportionately during COVID. And it is essential that people with disabilities are included in public policy discussions um, and not just taken um, as, as, as voices, uh, but allowing them to participate as real leaders at the federal, state, and local level. So Connor, I thank you uh, for taking on that role. Your voice and the voice of so many other advocates are essential contributions to our national conversation. And I am uh, excited to participate in tonight's conversation. And I remain committed to working to make sure that every single Virginian has access to the education, the workforce training, and the housing opportunities that they need to be successful. Again, thank you so much for allowing me to participate in this event, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much. We're excited to have you here. And now we'll turn things over to candidate Yesli Vega for her introduction. 
Thank you, Lucy. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be connected with you all. I first want to congratulate uh, Connor for such a fantastic opening statement. I'm sure, Sharon, that you are very proud of your son and all of the strides and accomplishments he's made. So, Connor, uh, thank you so much for your opening remarks. And, Sharon, thank you for reaching out. Uh, it's a great pleasure, again, to be here and to have this discussion. I am a mother of two beautiful children. My daughter, Nancy, is 14 years old, and my son, Arian, is 13. I am uh, married to my husband school sweetheart who is a U.S. Army veteran and I was also elected to the Board of County Supervisors in Prince William County in 2019. I'm also a member of law enforcement and I'm very excited to dive into this discussion Discussion because we're always in the world of law enforcement, thinking of new and creative ways to be able to help those with disabilities uh, to include the use of technology. Uh, one of the most important things for me as county supervisor is to ensure that all of my constituents have a seat at the table, that they know that I have been their voice and their representative uh, for these past three years. And so I never go into a meeting without going to my constituents first, and I certainly never take any votes without taking the opinions of my uh, constituents to heart. So that's really the way that I govern uh, through transparency transparency and accountability and always making decisions that is going to be best for them and not that of the special interest. So I'm really excited and very much looking forward uh, to discuss to the discussion here tonight and to answering any questions uh, that members of the audience may have and looking forward uh, to our further partnership as we uh, move forward and look ahead. I uh, hope to continue to be that voice and representative when we, when we make it to Congress and I very much look forward to the discussion here tonight. So thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to hear you all and also to voice uh, my positions on the issue. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. And now we will turn the microphone over to Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton for her introduction. Thank you so much, Lucy. And it's great to be here with everybody this evening. I'm gonna add my voice to the chorus of those congratulating and thanking Sharon and Connor for their, for their wonderful advocacy and for, for that great introduction. Connor, I'd like you to come to every single candidate forum that we have from this point forward and set out those ground rules. That would be wonderful. Um, so I'm Jennifer Wex, and I represent Virginia's 10th district in the United States House of Representatives. I've been here since 2019. And I just, rather than go through a regular campaign spiel, I just want to tell you a little bit about the disability community and how I came to be so involved with, with you guys. So I have a cousin who has a disability, and I saw firsthand how it impacted her family, how, how making sure that she got the care and services that she needed really impacted everybody in the family and every single day. And it doesn't, just, it doesn't just stop with the parents of that child. It goes to, to, to takes over generations. My cousin, her sister knows that she's gonna have to take care of her someday when her parents are no longer able to. So I have a great deal of respect for everything that you guys go through. And I'm very aware of the challenges that you have to deal with almost on a daily basis. It's a labor of love, but it is really a lot of work indeed. And there's a lot that goes into it. So in my professional career, before I served in elected office, I was a prosecutor in Loudoun County. I served as an advocate for abused and neglected kids. I also was a special justice in mental commitment hearings, and I, I also served even as a judge for a while. And in that capacity, I saw how people in the IDDD community also uh, ended, up, ended up in a disproportionate way in the criminal justice system, as well as in the, in, the, um, in the child dependency system or foster care, as well as those people who were in suffering from, from mental health issues or from substance abuse issues. So that led me to wanna to serve on the community services board, which I did. And I was very proud when I was accepted to that position. I really, really enjoyed it. One of the first things that we did actually in Loudoun County in the CSB was when I took, when I took my seat was that we, we eliminated, we changed the name of the, of the entity to eliminate an outdated and very uh, discriminatory term and replace it with developmental services, which I think speaks much better for what the actual services are that are provided. It wasn't that long ago that we did so. Because for me, it's about respect. And I think that that was very important. It was more than just paying lip service to these, these issues. It was about showing respect to the community and showing what we actually do. So in the Community Services Board, I worked a lot with the IDDD community. I learned, I learned firsthand the challenges that, that are being faced here. You know, just in Loudoun County, apparently we have, we have wait lists for, for a group home that is about 21 years old, 21 years you're expecting to have to wait for a position. Anything from anything from three months to 21 years, we're told, is what is what it will take for somebody to get a slot in one of those group homes. So that shouldn't be. Obviously, we need to do better. Um, but you know, I also I also went to the the visit the Northern Virginia Training Center with a family member of a, of a, of a resident there and learned about the challenges that they face. Now, because of the of the um, of the settlement decree, consent decree, and because of the closure of the the uh, of the training center, things got a lot more challenging for a lot of families. And that's something that we also need to do better on, making sure that we provide more community-based services. 
So when I started serving in elected office in the state Senate, one of the things that I was very adamant about doing was increasing the number of Medicaid waivers, which we were able to do. It still isn't adequate, but it's helped a lot, helped with a lot of families. Another thing I did was I listened to the community. So that's how I came up with things like Connor's Law, which I was very, very proud to get the help of Sharon and Connor Cummings in order to get that passed and help with uh, help make sure that that kids, kids and adults who are who are suffering from disabilities um, are able to get the support that they need from their non-custodial parents, even beyond the age of majority. Um, and I've continued to do that as a member of Congress. My very first uh, meeting as a member of Congress was with the little lobbyists, kids who kids who suffer from uh, very complex needs, which render them me medically fragile and really dependent on a lot of these programs. So I was very pleased to work with them and I've continued to use my position on the appropriations community to, to, uh, to fight for more funding for all of the priorities that we share. So I thank you so much for all that you guys do and I look forward to taking any questions that you have and hearing what's on your minds. Thanks so much. So now we'll turn the last introductory remark, but not least over to candidate Hung Kao who we are so happy to have with us tonight. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Lucy. And Connor, I mean, I think everybody said it. You're you're the reason that, that I'm running and you're the reason why I love meeting everybody every day on the campaign trail. Uh, it's just learning about your story and also just learning from you as well. Uh, my name is Hung Kao. I, uh, I'm a father of five, my, my beautiful bride of 24 years and I have raised uh, you know, five wonderful children from the ages of uh, uh, four to, to 19. So it's a big long uh, stretch, but uh, you know they, they make us uh, young and, and they keep us uh, lively in this uh, household. I came to this country as a Vietnamese refugee. I, I escaped in 1975 and this country gave us everything. So I, I, I harnessed the American dream. I mean, I went to Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. I was first class graduate from there. I went to United States Naval Academy. I have a master's in physics from Naval Postgraduate. I'm an MIT and, uh, and Harvard um, fellow. But, you know, and I, I paid back this country with 25 years in special operations fighting in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia. And um, really the the most significant thing I would say I did in the military was taking care of my soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, and uh, coast guardsmen, who, you know, thousands of them, but a few of them actually had children with special needs. And just learning how to cut through the red tape and pushing through when, and asking the hard question, why? Why does it have to be like this? And this is where, where we need to, to really push through all this bureaucracy and help those that need it the most. Um, I mean, even to the point where I would send guys home from from war because I would rather be a man short on the line than have their minds be somewhere else where it needs to be taking care of their family. And it, I, I can take a hit of one or two guys uh, in the battlefield, you know, for a few weeks when I know that when they come back, they'll be fully focused on the mission and, and be able to, to help save lives and, and take care of others while they know their, their family's taken care of. And that's my, that's really my, my pledge to you is I always take care of you know, my constituents, the way I took care of my soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen. Um, I had a lot of good friends, like I said, my, my roommate from the academy, his daughter was born with, uh, you know, cerebral palsy, and, you know, and my, our best friends in life had, had uh, you know, a, a child that was, they adopted with very special needs, and we learned to push through it, and this COVID really hurt our most vulnerable uh, citizens, which is the special needs community, as well as the elderly community. My father had a massive stroke in 2014, and we're just yearning and, and screaming for help during this time. And, and you know, just a, a, a blanket mandate from the federal government saying, no, we can't do that, or, or we can't, we have to shut down the government when, when, you know, honestly, the entire country needed to get back to work. And that's what I, I want to make sure we do is just to to not make blanket uh, decisions that that affect the entire country, especially the most vulnerable. Uh, my family and I uh, started a nonprofit organization called Audible Eggs, a 501c3, that helped uh, build uh, beeping Easter eggs for children with visual impairment. And that's really one of the most rewarding things we've ever done in, in our lives is just to teach our kids how to serve others. And so I want to continue to learn and, and listen tonight and learn from you guys so that I can be smarter when I get in Congress to help you all. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for your introductory remarks. And as we turn it over to the questions this evening, I wanted to share a comment that had been sent into us as we were reaching out to folks who had registered for the forums. And the very first person who replied to me 
was a father who said, thank you so much for for making sure that candidates remember people with disabilities and think about them, even if it's for only one night. I don't think anybody who's here tonight only thinks about these issues for one night, but that perspective, that sense of being lost and ignored, helpless, overwhelmed, not having power is something that we heard echoed in very many of the questions that we had. And that perspective brought me to tears. It was a very powerful way for me to start thinking about this forum tonight. So I wanted to share that as we started talking. Um, almost half of the questions that we got sent in prior to tonight from families related to Social Security and Medicaid asset limits. So that's where I'm going to start us tonight. I have never had so many. It, it's a hot button issue for sure, but this really took the cake. So um, for folks who don't know, Supplemental Security Income, SSI, is a social security program that provides critical supports for millions of people with disabilities with the idea of helping them afford basics like food and rent. But it makes it very hard for users to pull themselves out of poverty the asset limit of $2,000 for one person or $3,000 for a married couple combined hasn't been adjusted since 1989. It's a big barrier to people with disabilities working toward independence, being able to afford housing and otherwise be successfully included in their communities. And so we would love to hear from all of our candidates about support for any legislation that would look at these barriers to work and public benefit asset programs that really in many cases do the opposite of their intention. And so first time since we're rotating, candidate Vega, you are up. Thank you, Lucy. I think it's important uh, to note that more than 7 million people are relying on this program, but unfortunately, its asset limits is outdated and does not allow people to save for emergencies. We all know that emergencies uh, present themselves in the uh, least appropriate moment, if you will. Such emergencies may include but are not limited to car repair, home damage, or other unexpected emergencies. Um, I'm sorry, I have a timer on my light, so I have to wave a little bit so that I can turn on. Um, I'll make sure that I change that when I'm done answering the question. And so uh, taking care of our disabled community uh, and ensuring that they have the necessary resources to afford food and rent is imperative to giving them a high quality of life. Uh, I believe that we must also work to create new opportunities to help individuals and their families out of difficult situations without providing additional uh, red tape or burdens to them or anyone else. Uh, the legislation introduced by Senator Brown and Portman gives us a new path to take a look at that and uh, would also, in my, in my opinion, release some of the burdens uh, on our disabled communities and their family. I very much look forward to working with the senators and members of Congress and organizations uh, such uh, as ARC to ensure uh, that we have the resources in place along with the partnership. I think it's also important to highlight uh, that this bill drastically improves the lives, the lives of SSI's recipients by increasing the asset limit to 10,000 for individual and 20,000 for married couple, uh, allowing them to save more again for unexpected emergencies, also giving them financial security and independence. And also it's important uh, to note that this bill adjusts for inflation every year. So uh, I am committed uh, to working uh, with members of Congress and ensuring that we have uh, the resources in place uh, to facilitate things, uh, not just for members of our disabled community, but also for their uh, caregivers their families who uh, do so much in ensuring that they are viable and authentic citizens. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And now we'll turn over to Representative Wexton with the same question about Social Security asset limits. Thank you, Lucy. Now, one of the things that people may not be aware of about, 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 um, about SSI is that it only costs the U.S. about 20.27% of our GDP. Right, so that's that's minimal, and it's also one of the most efficient federal programs, where more than nine dollars of nine nine of every ten dollars goes directly to benefits. So it is a very efficient program, but you can tell a lot about a country by how you treat the most vulnerable. And unfortunately, when it comes to SSI benefits, I feel that we have we have we have really been, been lacking in terms of what we provided to our people. As was noted, the asset limits have been frozen since 1989. Uh, if if we just were adjusting for inflation, that two thousand dollars would be almost worth five thousand dollars now. But that's still inadequate. So that's why I support the Asset Act, which would increase the level from $2,000 for an individual and $3,000 for a married couple to $10,000 for an individual and $20,000 for a married couple, a couple to eliminate the marriage penalty for one thing, and also to index it for inflation. It's not just that. In 2020, the maximum federal benefit for individuals was $783 a month. That's not even three quarters of the federal poverty level. So we're not, we're not doing a good job for our people. We need to do better and we need to make sure that we increase that as well. 
Now, also another thing that, that that reminds me of is a personal needs allowance, which is something that I became passionate about when I was in the state legislature. It was brought to my attention that everybody who is, who is uh, on Medicaid in a facility only gets to keep about $30 a month for their personal needs. Now, this includes everything. This includes things like having to, uh, having to get adult diapers on your own, having to have a cell plan so you can communicate with your family, having to get a haircut or a shave or, or personal toiletries. $30 isn't enough, so we need to increase that. I have I had legislation in the House of Representatives as well as in the State Senate to increase it to $60 and to index it for inflation. So these are things that we can do, that we can and should do, and I certainly support doing, and I will continue to do so as your member of Congress in the future. Thank you so much. And now we will turn things over to candidate Cal with the same question about SSI asset limits. Okay, so 1989, that's when I graduated from high school. I'm a 50 year old one, 51 year old man right now. So you're saying we haven't updated this since I was in high school. And it's just, it seems like a no brainer. And honestly, I don't know why it's not done yet. I mean, if I've been in office for the last four years or, or heck if my party has had both chambers of the house and the, the, the executive branch, I think I don't think we'd be talking about this right now. I think this would be a done deal. In fact, this this seems to me like forced poverty for for a you know our constituents who are trying so hard to to work uh you know work up and, and, and stand up on their own two feet. And so yes, we we will be doing this and, and we will get this changed. I mean this is not this is like I said, this is a no brainer. We should be we should have taken care of this a long time ago. Thank you so much. And last to answer the question, we will have Representative Spanberger here. Thank you so much. Uh, I am proud, absolutely, to support the elimination of this penalty. And, and what I have heard from constituents is the real impact that this uh, provision has, this old, old provision from 1989 uh, that punishes people for working, for saving for their future, and frankly, for getting married. Um, increasing asset limits and income limits for the SSI program could expand economic opportunity and the mobility for individuals with disabilities here in Virginia and across the country. Uh, and certainly, as we heard tonight, there uh, continues to be bipartisan interest in ensuring that this program um, is able to be a lifeline out of poverty, uh, but one that creates opportunity. So I look forward to continuing to work with the disability community, my colleagues, and uh, to ensure that we fix this decades old problem. But I would also reference another piece of legislation, the Work Without Worry. Um, I, I'm proud to co-sponsor that piece of legislation because far too frequently uh, young adults as they get older, um, if they are the beneficiaries of their parents' social security, uh, there are severe limitations on how much they can work and how much independence they can, uh, they can have. And so this bipartisan legislation would ensure that again, we are allowing uh, or not prohibiting people uh, through problems and hurdles within the law, not prohibiting people from seeking opportunity, from seeking work um, and from, from being able to save for their futures. And so I'm proud to support both these pieces of legislation and uh, thank you for the question. Thank you so much for your time. So now we're going to move on to a new topic that's no less important to the disability community. And that's one about the direct caregiver issue. So nationwide, direct care workers on average make less than about $15 an hour, roughly $30,000 a year. And there's more than 50% turnover annually for those positions, making it very difficult to get continuity in services and quality of care, especially for people who need caregivers to perform vital, intimate, or medical tasks, whom we don't necessarily want strangers coming in and out of our house every few months to learn how to get into our home and to be touching our bodies and learning about us. Um, we know that this workforce is disproportionately women of color who do vital supports for people with disabilities to keep them out of more expensive and lower quality institutional care. Despite the value of that work, we don't see it in their wages. We see caregivers work multiple jobs to get by and tired, overworked, exhausted caregivers are a recipe for mistakes and burnout, anger and frustration. We see this across the country. And this is a significant issue in the more populated parts of Virginia where it's very difficult to get by on those caregiver wages. And so people in high population density with high need struggle to reach a limited pool. How do we get ahead of this challenge, ensure everyone can age in place and find appropriate caregivers? And this fine representative Wexton is up first. 
Thank you so much, Lucy. This is something I feel really passionately about because we've all seen the impacts when you have people who, who, cannot, who do not make a living wage trying to take care of people who, who are so vulnerable. And so the biggest thing we can do is pay these people a living wage. You know, this is something that we, the congressional Democrats have been fighting for for years. And we did, we did vote to, to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I think that we need to insist that, that, that these people be paid a living wage and that, that, that you know, we get them the, the care that they need. Another thing that's worth noting is that, is that COVID, COVID was especially difficult on the, especially hard on this workforce. You know, a lot of times they were forced to go back and forth from home to home to home during early days of COVID and in so doing ended up spreading COVID to their to their charges. Now that's not what they wanted to do. That wasn't what they that wasn't that wasn't what their attention was, but it was they were offered the choice between, you know, between to 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 survive or to or to you know take a chance and risk hurting risk hurting the people that they're looking out for. And that's not something they should have to do. So making sure that they also have things like paid medical leave. You know, paid sick leave in order to be able to take days off when they're ill, not not spread trend or transmit disease to the people that they're caring for. So I think that this is this is just a matter of making priority to to make these investments, and this is something that we congressional Democrats have been trying to do for a long time. We're going to keep trying because it's the right thing to do, and it's so important, especially as more and more boomers age, as more and more people need these need these supports. And the the thing that is so so frustrating to me is that it ultimately saves money. Because letting people age in place with the dignity in their homes definitely saves money over putting them in an institutional setting. And it's just, it just makes so much more sense. I don't see why we can't get it done. I'm going to keep fighting to make sure that we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we'll ask that same question of candidate Cow about the direct caregiver need. That's a great question because I'm telling you right now, that's one of the hardest work jobs in, in, the, in our society is the healthcare workers. I mean, it's very arduous on the body. It's hard on the body. And, and you need really a young workforce sometimes to do that. I mean, I, I saw my, my mother-in-law took care of the elderly when, uh, you know, for years. And, you know, the toll is taken on our body. It's just, it's very hard work. And we have a, a workforce now that's used to just staying at home and not, and just getting stimulus checks and, and not working. I mean, the, the work ethic in our community is gone. And we need to reinvigorate it and, and, and push it again. Um, again, I saw this with my father too, when, when uh, during the pandemic, when the government just arbitrarily shut down the entire country and, and, you know, and we couldn't get help to him. I couldn't even go to him, you know, between deployments to Afghanistan. I mean, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't get to my father to help him. And ultimately he, he, he passed away because, you know, we couldn't get the care for him and it it it, it hurts and I, I can only imagine how the, the parents are feeling right now when when caregivers are, are not allowed to come in to help their children when they can't go to school and, and instead of progressing they actually regress during this pandemic and that's what we needed you know we, we really need to just get government out of the way and let let the free market work itself out in fact we have members of Congress who are willing to put uh, you know have proposed a a cap on traveling nurses. You know, again, like I said, this is a very hard and, and arduous profession and, and there's a supply and demand, right? And so some of these nurses are trying to make ends meet and they, they found that the, the best way for them uh, to make ends meet for the families to be traveling nurses. And we have members who are proposing bills to cap their salaries and it's wrong. We need to let the free market work its way out so that the supply and demand, you know, can work its way out. In, and get more health worker into to our um, our communities. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for your answer. And now we'll turn over to Representative Spanberger with the same question here about caregivers. Having spoken to so many families who rely on caregivers and having spoken to so many caregivers who are constituents who are among the most hardworking, empathetic, kind, and thoughtful workforce I have ever encountered, um, I will continue to advocate for their ability to do their job and to do so uh, at a living wage, to do so in a way that recognizes uh, the physical toll that the job has. Uh, in the introduction, you mentioned the personal care, the support that so many uh, individuals need, lifting people, moving people, physically engaging in, in a very personal and professional way. Uh, this is a skill set that is unique. It's a skill set of a person who is driven by a belief in helping others. 
Uh, and among the things we can be doing and should be doing is raising the minimum wage. As Congresswoman Wexton mentioned, uh, I have also voted to increase the minimum wage because recognizing the impact and the value of our workforce, particularly those who care for, at times, some of our most vulnerable uh, neighbors and community members is incredibly important. Um, we have to continue recruiting and educating and training and retaining a professional direct care workforce. This is a professional workforce that they're giving medication, they're engaged uh, in, in very personal caring for individuals. They have to be aware uh, when there's physical limitations and abilities, uh, they have to be aware of what the needs are of their uh, of the person that they're they're taking care of. I was proud to vote for the American Rescue Plan, which provided strong investments to increase support for home and community-based services. Um, and frankly, Virginia, the General Assembly, uh, used its share of funding to pay bonuses to providers and to increase reimbursements. And that was the right move that was so vitally helpful for them to take. Supplemental funding is great, uh, but a long-term commitment, a long-term federal commitment to improving the workforce is necessary. Um, and certainly also uh, reimbursements through state's Medicaid programs are necessary. That's how we support people with disabilities, their right to live in the community, uh, their ability for their family members to know that they are getting quality care um, and allow family caregivers to go back to work if they so choose, because so frequently uh, the caregiving falls on a family member. Um, and we need to make sure that the professional caregivers uh, who are a lifeline for so many families uh, are recognized for the extraordinary work that they do throughout our communities. Thank you so much. And last on this question, we'll turn things over to candidate Vega. We would love your thoughts on this caregiver issue. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Uh, look, before the pandemic, there was already a shortage of high quality caregivers. And uh, since COVID, the issue has been made worse. Uh, the shortage in workers caused by the pandemic actually forced many mothers, fathers, and other family members to take on the roles of unpaid caregivers, uh, pretty much having to uh, learn things that perhaps they did not learn. And uh, this resulted in people having to give up their jobs, lost wages, and financial trouble for many of these families. Additionally, I think we cannot forget that the closure of schools made the situation much more difficult for parents and also uh, for, for, for children. We are now starting to see some of the data come in of uh, the lost in learning, uh, I can share with you a personal story that uh, uh, was shared with me by one of our special uh, ed teachers here in Prince William County, where she was literally in tears talking to me about how saddened she was to see uh, all of the lost learning of her students and how she does not believe that she's going to be able to get them back to where they were pre-pandemic. And so uh, parents were having to balance at-home learning, shortages in caregiver resources, and on top of that, their own job. So I can uh, tell you that as a daughter, wife, and mother, I understand that we all want uh, the best opportunities and care possible for our family members, for our loved ones, especially our children. Uh, this includes high quality caregivers who will provide the best care possible for those that need it. I think that we also have to take that a little step further though, because now we're still dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic and uh, fathers, mo moms wanna continue uh, caring for their children. So we have to uh, do better in regards to compensating those that have to have step into a role that they weren't expecting to step in. And so I very much look forward uh, to working diligently for these families and individuals to ensure that they receive the resources and the care that they reserve, uh, deserve uh, rather. Um, I also think it's important to highlight what re research shows. And that is that individuals with disabilities who are engaged in their community have a better quality of life than those that live in an institution institutional setting. Uh, these services allow them, again, to live, to work, and to have a real relationship with members of the community that they belong to. And I think that uh, that's very important uh, to, to remember and to never forget. Um, also, by focusing on providing quality jobs in the caregiver field, uh, we can lower the waste, wait list and the time uh, that uh, many families are experiencing because of the shortages uh, that we're facing uh, pre-pandemic and now post-pandemic. So I very much look forward when elected to find common sense solutions to fill these necessary jobs when I'm elected to Congress and to continue the discussion because there is much work to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we're going to uh, change gears a little bit and talk a bit about what happens. Forgive me a second while I move our spotlights around. What happens when sometimes we don't have good caregivers <laughs> or support? Um, and that's the issue where people with disabilities are arrested and incarcerated. 
far out of proportion with our numbers in the population. Generally, people with developmental disabilities are estimated to be about 3% of the population. People with disabilities in general, about 20% of the population, yet we make up at least 40% of the incarcerated population. Disproportionately, not only people with disabilities and people of color are affected by this issue. We heard a lot and have a lot of comments on Facebook and the chat and questions tonight about this issue. So we would love to know what the candidates would like to do to turn around this really troublesome trend where we see people with disabilities um, disproportionately arrested and put behind bars. And tonight for this question, first to candidate count. Thank you. Just, um, I wanna share with you what Sheriff Mike Chapman um, has done in this community. You know, when uh, when he took office, when he was voted in 2012, his uh, sister-in-law had um, schizophrenia and his wife Ann made him swear to, to make mental health one of his key issues. And so within the first uh, year, 25% of his deputies were trained in mental health and uh, and special needs and recognizing, you know, those who, who you know, who, who are, who, who needs a little ex, extra love. And by the fourth year in office, 100% of his deputies were trained. And, and even with that, um, they were well trained so well that they were able to uh, train all first responders, uh, EMTs, uh, the um, firefighters, as well as uh, hospital um, you know, workers in, in how to diagnose, not diagnose, but you know, how to, how to handle people with special needs or, or, uh, or mental health uh, problems. Uh, and in fact, their statistics went from 44 uses of tasers a year on average down to four. And it's so it's leaders like this at the lower uh, level, you know, at the at the community level that we need to to lean on uh, guys like Mike Chapman, guys like Glenn Hill, guys, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Connie Compton and, and Rappahannock, as well as, uh, you know, Jeremy Falls in, in um, Fauquier. These are the, the leaders that, that are on the ground, you know, we call it in the Navy, we call it on the deck plates, right? The, these, this is where the rubber meets the road. And we really need these leaders to step up. And, and as a congressman, I, I want to be able to help listen to them and see what they need to, 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 to give them the, the support they need. I mean, I know some of these sheriffs are, are yearning to talk to the representatives. They haven't heard from them in two and a half years, but that's not going to be me. I'm I'm going to be out there talking and listening to them and seeing what they need because sometimes we have supported people and we have supporting people. So in this case, they are the supported. I'm the supporting guy, and I will be supporting them every single step of the way. Thank you so much for your answer. And now we'll turn the same question over to Representative Spanberger to talk about this disability and justice intersection. Thank you. Thank you. When we look at the fact that people behind bars are much more likely to report having a disability than non-incarcerated people, we have to recognize that there's something wrong with how we are doing things. This longstanding disparity has its roots in our country's historic underinvestment and community-based alternatives to institutionalization. Um, and when I say investments and underinvestment, it comes down to dollars. It comes down to investing supports so that local programs can work. It comes down to investing in community services uh, so that more individuals who have disabilities or who might have mental illness are not swept into the criminal justice system. And to be directly responsive to the needs of the communities that I represent, I have taken a couple steps. One, recognizing that so much when a law enforcement officer uh, is engaging with and working with uh, and confronted with someone who might be suffering from mental illness, who might be suffering from substance use disorder, or who might have a disability that may not be obvious to that officer on the scene, the importance of training is so significant. And this is why I lead the bipartisan effort in Congress uh, to nearly double uh, support to the COPS program. This is the Community Oriented Policing Program. It's been in existence uh, since the 90s and it is a vital program that allows for our communities to get federal dollars to invest in recruitment, retention, training. And that training is so vital to their ability uh, to do the sorts of things that uh, the previous candidate just mentioned. Um, I was also so proud to write and introduce and in fact pass in the House of Representatives and we're hopeful that it'll move in the Senate uh, next month, the bipartisan Summer Barrow Prevention Treatment and Recovery Act. 
This is a piece of legislation that I wrote directly in response to the needs that we are seeing within our communities um, and the shortfalls of our behavioral health system. Um, in particular, the bill would triple federal investments in jail diversion programs in our communities over the next five years. And so when we're talking about the challenges that people are facing, that our communities are facing, that families whose loved ones either have a disability uh, and, and might engage differently with the criminal justice system or are suffering from mental illness, um, recognizing the importance of these important jail diversion programs and funding them uh, has been a priority. I've also co-sponsored legislation to authorize federal funding for mental and behavioral health response teams uh, to respond to the mental health crises uh, to ensure that when someone is called out to respond to a 911 call, to respond to an emergency, that people who are able to and knowledgeable of how to contend with those who might be in a point of crisis or who might not be verbal or who might have other challenges, uh, that those resources, that those trained professionals are responding right alongside uh, the officers. And so I am so proud of the work that I've done legislatively. Um, I'm also proud of the work that we've already passed through the House and, and pushed into law. Uh, the American Rescue Plan provided significant funding for states to implement new programs to promote mental health access and encourage alternatives uh, to police involvement during a mental health crisis. Um, certainly the Community Mental Health Service Block Grant funding has been vital lifeline for so many Virginians, um, and importantly, increasing Medicaid funding to states that opt to cover mobile crisis intervention services uh, was an important element of this legislation. Thank you so much. And now we're going to turn the same question over to candidate Vega to talk. Uh, and you mentioned in your opening remarks about your background in law enforcement, so I know we're all eager to hear here. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, first and foremost, as a law enforcement officer, I believe in the rule of law, as well as equal justice under the law. I find it reprehensible that individuals take advantage of others to commit crimes, and we must do everything to ensure that those who coerce individuals with disabilities to commit crimes are held accountable for their actions. Uh, everybody so far has talked about training and how vital training is. Uh, I am proud to share with our audience that I am a member of the crisis intervention team, and I commend uh, Sheriff Glenn Hill for ensuring that every single one of his deputies goes through this extensive training that helps identify uh, certain things when you respond to a call or when you're engaging with someone on the streets uh, that might lead to discovering that perhaps this is somebody that does have indeed a disability and how to property, properly handle that call. Uh, we must do everything that we can, again, to hold individuals who take advantage of members of the disability community into committing crimes. But most importantly, I think that we have to highlight these trends to our judicial system where individuals with disabilities could be misidentified uh, and that may also lead to a placement in the wrong institution uh, by advocating with disability organizations. And again, I can't thank you all enough for, for, for hosting this forum. I think, um, you know, we, we can work directly with our, with our uh, justice system uh, so that we can uh, find firsthand solutions that will help the disability community from incarceration. Uh, individuals with disabilities have the same rights and uh, don't let anybody ever tell you uh, any different in our justice system as everyone else. And I uh, look forward to continuing to work with everyone involved to ensure uh, that those rights are never trampled over and that uh, they too have access to a quality justice system that treats them fairly as they do uh, everybody else that comes through uh, the, the, the judicial system. But again, I can't stress enough uh, how, important to, how important training has been, uh, not just for Prince William County Sheriff's Office, but also for uh, the police department. Department. Uh, this uh, board also enacted the co-responder unit that has been instrumental in assisting officers also when responding to calls uh, for service when uh, we believe that it's probably, you know, a call related to a mental health situation. And so I very much look forward to con continuing to lead uh, with my uh, law enforcement background and experience on this matter and being a partner uh, with members of our uh, uh, disability community. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much. And last on this question is Representative Weston. Thank you so much, Lucy. Well, we're reaching the point in this in this question where everybody has said something, but but uh, where everything has been said, but not everybody has said it, right? But I do have something I'd like to add. And be before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the whole issue of the of the training because that's huge. And you know, this is one of the reasons that I wanted to serve in the CSB in the first place because I saw how how the the criminal impact the criminal justice system was disproportionately filled with people with disabilities and with mental health issues and things like that. 
and unfortunately it hasn't it hasn't you know it hasn't it hasn't been been solved but it, it, fortunately we now have a lot more awareness of it so i'm delighted that we have things like crisis intervention training for our local law enforcement and things like that and i'm really really pleased that in the american rescue plan we we passed legislation that included an increase in the fmap for for states that 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 implement uh, mobile crisis intervention units in, in criminal justice cases so that's really huge and i think it will help a lot of states to implement these programs in nationwide but I wanna go backwards. And before we start talking about law enforcement and getting people involved in the criminal justice system, I wanna talk a little bit about schools because it is true that the school to prison pipeline is real. And it's something that Virginia had been, had been really a bit, pretty bad culprit in for many, many years. This is something I felt really passionately about as a parent, as somebody who, who represented juveniles in these cases and who saw the way that, that you know, a lot of times kids were, were disproportionately, uh, disproportionately not just impacted by, by referred to criminal justice system from, from schools, but also through the, the discipline process, through suspension, through seclusion and restraint and things of that nature. So I'm very, very pleased that in the state general assembly, we, we, did, we did take steps to eliminate seclusion and restraint in Virginia public schools while I was there. And now we're working on doing it nationwide. I'm very, very pleased that we have legislation in, in the House of Representatives that would do just that, uh, because it is, it is very hard on kids and it does set them up for failure later on. You know, the worst thing in the world for kids or for a kid who's nonverbal or who, who can't communicate or who has, you know, autism spectrum disorder, maybe doesn't communicate the same way that other that other that other kids do is to be is to be, you know, is to be placed in handcuffs and thrown in the back of a squad car. You can't let that happen, which is why we need the training to start a lot earlier for things like SROs and people like that to be aware of the different kinds of kids and the different kind of abilities that they have. So this is all something that's very important, but it's it's a, it's a continuum. You know, you can't just start at the, when the kids are adults. You need to start when you start when they're young, and just make sure that everybody's aware of all of the issues that there there are. So I'll keep fighting to do that as a member of Congress, as your member of Congress in the future as well. Thank you so much. And it turns out that Zoom has decided to quit my camera, so you're going to have to suffer through this forum without my lovely face jumping in unless it resets, because if I log out and log back in, everything ends. So <laughs> we'll get a great view of our interpreter here while I'm speaking. Let's talk now a little bit about an issue we've touched on lately, and that's the core of disability support services, home and community-based care. Those supports that folks with disabilities rely on every day for things like support to be successful on the job, to get around the community, to bathe, get dressed, take medication, and more. There's not enough money in the home and community-based services program to support everyone. In fact, about 800,000 people across the country and 14,000 in Virginia in specific are stuck on waiting lists without the ability to get any of the services they need. Then we rely on unpaid family caregivers to fill in care needs, often requiring them to lose their job or step down from jobs. And the pandemic has made this worse than ever. In fact, Sharon Connor and I spent our morning in the governor's mansion in Virginia talking to families who have lost all of the very few supports they had um, during the pandemic. So starting with Representative Spanberger, we would love your thoughts on how we address this home and community-based service shortage that's affecting the entire country and Virginia in a big way. Uh, well, thank you for this question. And this is not an issue that is new to me because it's an issue that I have heard about from so many constituents, uh, from parents who do extraordinary advocacy on behalf of their children, from parents who are aging and worry about their children's future if they are unable um, to, to, to get off these waiting lists, parents who uh, continue to fight every single day to make sure that their kids um, are, are taken care of uh, even, even once they are well into their adulthood uh, because they still continue to be their, their babies. Um, and we know that the Supreme Court has ruled that the ADA gives individuals with disabilities the right to live in their community um, and not be confined to institutions. And I strongly support um, all of the anti-discrimination provisions within the ADA. Um, but I have met far too many families and individuals within Virginia who have been waiting for years for the kind of at-home services and support that they need um, and support that should be guaranteed to them. And last year, I was proud to vote for the American Rescue Plan, which provided more than $12 billion in funding for state-level HCBS services through the Medicaid program, including $273 million that went to Virginia. So these dollars allowed Virginia to invest in expanding home services and bolster the care workforce. 
Um, and, and frankly, this was a good first step. It's a first step that I was proud to take, um, but Congress needs to have a sustained commitment to increasing funding to make a long-term impact on these wait lists. Um, that's why I am proud to co-sponsor uh, the legislation called the Latanya Reeves Freedom Act, which would codify the right for individuals with disabilities to receive care in their communities. Um, and this is a piece of legislation uh, that a version of it, of an earlier version of it, the Disability Integration Act, um, has previously passed the House. And we, uh, everyone who's a co-sponsor of this legislation, uh, and it is bipartisan, we have two Republicans who joined, more than 125 Democrats. Uh, this legislation codifies the rights for individuals with disabilities to access health care services in their homes and in their communities, um, which we know the Supreme Court, as I mentioned, has upheld. Um, but this would make sure that we can then see that Medicaid is making the corresponding investments uh, to providing community-based services so that individuals and families are not stuck on these wait lists forever so that parents with multiple children can enjoy the, the joy of being a parent to uh, their children and not um, every single minute of the day a, a caregiver that they get the support and additional resources uh, and support that they need and that they should have. Um, and I am proud to be a co-sponsor of this legislation um, and I will continue to advocate for its passage because it's about the dignity of each individual person. Uh, it's about the support that these families need, that all families uh, who have uh, children with uh, specific and special needs need. Uh, and I'll continue to advocate for this legislation. Uh, I'll continue to co-sponsor it and ultimately uh, work to get it across the finish line, the House, the Senate, and the President's desk. Thank you so much. And now we'll ask the same question of candidate Vega here about home and community-based services. <clears throat> Take your time. Okay. We've got lots to talk about, but there's definitely time for people to breathe and take a drink of water. about that. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, sorry about that. Uh, you know, the reality is that the demand for caregivers um, is high as is. I kind of already mentioned that um, in one of the previous responses that I provided. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the demand is going to be greater. The number of elderly uh, and disabled in uh, need of assistance is expected to double in the next two decades. So we certainly uh, have a lot of work ahead uh, because we must we must ensure uh, that we have the resources in place uh, to assist families um, when it comes to providing the best quality of care. Uh, for their loved ones. I can share with you a personal story. I have a friend uh, who is a fellow military spouse. Her husband uh, is a veteran. He served our nation and he is disabled. And uh, when we talk about the red tape and all of the barriers that make it almost nearly impossible for families to have access to a professional trained caregiver, um, I know firsthand. Uh, uh, I think that it's important to include in the conversation our veterans uh, because uh, oftentimes our veterans uh, have the same challenges uh, that a lot of folks in our community communities are facing when it comes to uh, access to, to professional caregivers. I also mentioned how many have had to step into a role that they never thought they would be stepping in. And so this is a story of my girlfriend um, who has now had to uh, step into this role of caring for her husband because they've been on a waiting list for a very long time and they've been left with no other option. Uh, she did everything that she needed to do in order to apply to be classified as an adequate caregiver for her husband and was unfortunately denied. Uh, not only is this unacceptable for uh, our veterans, community, it's just flat out unacceptable across the board. So there's a lot of work that we have to do. We have to make sure uh, that we are uh, incentivizing people to come into this line of work, uh, that they feel that their work is valuable, and that we treat them with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Uh, 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 Representative Wexton talked about having family members um, who uh, uh, deal with a disability. Well, uh, I share the same sentiment as I do, and I've seen firsthand the challenges that come with caring for a loved one 
one and not having the proper uh, caregiver and or resources needed. And so I very much look forward to do everything that I can to ensure that not only are the resources that are available for families dealing with this situation, but also doing away with all of this red tape that is making it increasingly difficult for families uh, to acquire a professional caregiver and or be in a position uh, to care for their loved ones themselves. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And now we'll turn the camera over to Representative Wexton with that question about the home and community diversity officers. Thank you, Lucy. And this is something that is a huge issue for so many people. And one of the reasons that I that I wanted to serve on the CSB, you know, seeing when 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 the when the consent decree went into effect, and we closed all the training centers, but we didn't have the community based services in place to take care of these people, and we still don't. So this is something that's a huge, huge issue. Also, one of the things that I find very frustrating is that so much of the care that you get depends on what state you live in. And so if you're here in Virginia, you probably won't get as good as good an option as you do if you're in other states where they have where they're more generous with their benefits. So I think that it's time that we make a historic federal investment in these in these benefits and ensure that people have the access to the caregivers that they need and that that people can people can if they want to get a family caregiver that they're able to get them as well, that they're able to be paid for that because it's so important that these people be cared for in their homes because it's you know aging with dignity and, and living with dignity in your own home. And as I said earlier, I mean, this saves us money ultimately, so I don't understand why we can't do it. But we've, this is something where we, have, where we have made investments in millions and we need to really do it in billions, frankly. And I would be willing to do that if, if I'm reelected. Thank you so much. And now to candidate Cal. First of all, how are our interpreters doing? Because you ladies are moving your hands so fast, and I, I hope you guys don't throw a shoulder or something like that. Uh, but uh, I promise, you know, my, my wife always makes fun of me because when I get flustered or something like that, I end up speaking in Vietnamese or French or something like that. So I promise I won't throw weird words out for you. But um, yeah, this the biggest problem we have right now, honestly, is this all this red tape. You know, it's just, I'm 100% disabled uh, veteran, combat uh, combat disabled, and, and I've got there's some issues that took up to a year for me to deal with and it's just not right and i can only imagine what these the, the parents of special needs children have to go through i mean not only are you taking care of your children uh during the day because you know the, the uh, pandemic shut down the whole nation but now you have this mounds of paperwork to fill out you know i mean and then it gets rejected because you didn't have the right cover sheet on your tps report i mean it's just this is ridiculous. And, and now we're playing catch up. I mean, what we need to do as as a, the federal government is to pledge to never, ever shut down the, the economy again and drive hardworking uh, you know, people out of the business of, of health care because it's just too hard because they have to follow certain guidelines now that, that just were arbitrarily put onto our country. And, uh, you know, and they're yearning to get back to, to helping the people that they 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 took an oath to help. And so that's what we need to do, first of all, because I feel like a lot of things that we're proposing now or we hear propose is now we're playing catch up to fix a problem that we created ourselves by shutting down the economy and shutting down this country. So that's the first thing we need to do is to promise not to do this ever again. And, and then the second thing we need to do is just get rid of the red tape and and find ways to, to streamline these processes. And that's what I've done best in the military is, you know, I, I would tell my staff or even lawyers saying, hey, don't tell me that I can't do something. Tell me how I can do it legally or, or quickly. That's what we need to do is just to stop, stop with all this bureaucracy and, and just get the help to these parents who are yearning for help. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. And now, candidate Vega, we would like to turn a new question over to you. We're going to ask about some barriers to employment that people with disabilities face. It's a massive concern for the disability community. People with developmental disabilities in particular are found to be unemployed or underemployed at rates hovering around 80% of the population. There's still federal laws on the books actively being used in Virginia that allow people with disabilities to be paid sub-minimum wage, sometimes pennies per hour for their work. What can you do to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our businesses who need quality employees and we're making opportunities for employment very real for the disability community? 
so when I uh, first saw this question, uh, my mind immediately went to uh, Josh, who works at my local giant here in the county. And uh, Josh always greets folks with a beautiful smile. And so uh, we must remember that the Americans with Disability Act of 1990 prohibited discrimination based on disability. Since that time, we have made tremendous strides forward with different social programs. The reason why I mentioned Josh is because I think that it's critically important to acknowledge businesses that employ, uh, you know, uh, individuals that do have a disability because, again, uh, you know, we want people to feel viable. We want them to feel as they are part of our community, and I think that's important. Uh, so while there are already some incredible organizations and programs that provide, uh, you know, job training that help individuals with disabilities, disabilities build skills and find employment opportunities, there's absolutely always room for growth. Um, it's not just about helping these folks find a job, but making sure that they're learning the skills they need to be successful at work and outside of work to feel that, uh, you know, uh, sense of I'm independent, I'm able because they absolutely are. So skills uh, like the ability to interview, learn to problem solve, the importance of teamwork and how to commu communicate, I think are essential. And uh, that's exactly what my local giant uh, provides for Josh. Uh, skills like these and many others they learn in these vital programs create individuals who are prepared uh, for the workforce and can commit to a job just like any other American. Um, I also think it's important to support organizations and businesses uh, uh, again, you know, that are currently proactively soliciting, um, you know, uh, folks with a disability all around the country uh, to come and to, and to work, uh, because, you know, it speaks volumes, again, uh, to, to ensuring that members of, of, of the disability community feel whole. Uh, additionally, I want to make sure that we're finding work that is meaningful, not just, you know, find a job for somebody to be busy, busy but we want people to feel that they, uh, you know, are, are important, that they're valued, and that their job is meaningful uh, to them as an individual. Uh, folks shouldn't just have the opportunity to work for a business, but I think that we should also get to a point where we're encouraging them to start their own, uh, again, because they are, they're, they're, they're capable of doing that. And so I wanna commend uh, my local giant, not that they're ever gonna hear me talking about this, um, but I just you know think that it's great that you know Josh works there, uh, my kids love him, I love him, and I think that we need a little bit more of that in, 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 in our uh, district here in the seventh, but not just in the seventh, but in our country as a whole. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much. And now we'd like to ask the same question about employment opportunities to Representative Weston. Thank you so much, Lucy. Now, the uh, the COVID uh, the COVID pandemic has been really, really hard on this community. And it's really put an impact on, on a lot of the folks who would be out there working otherwise. But thankfully, thankfully, we seem to be past that now and things, things are getting back to normal. One of the things that we need to do is definitely support the implementation of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which would, which would go a long way to, to opening up these kinds of jobs for people and also ensuring that they have the kind of training and, and careers that they need. Um, another thing that we should do is, is make sure that we have employment first policies so that they can have a real job with real wages and ensure that they can't be hired for pennies on the dollar because that's just not fair. You know, I mean, this is, this is they, they deserve the dignity of work and they deserve a pay, dignity of a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And that's what they do, and that's what they should receive. Now we do have we do have good providers like Echo in in Leesburg, and and uh, and Northwest Works in Winchester, which 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 work with these communities and get them in and have them working. But they need to make living wages as a part of that. And I think that that's something that's very important, and something I would fight for as a member of Congress in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now to candidate Cow, same question about employment. Thank you so much. You know, there's a saying in Navy that uh, there's no such thing as bad sailor. There's just bad leaders because there's a place for everyone. Right. I mean, there's there's every person has brings value. And, you know, so for certain people, I mean, they're, uh, you know, may, maybe it's a, a mundane or, or repetitive task that uh, others don't want to do. But for, for certain members of our, our community, that, that's what they thrive in. And that's what we need to do. We need to find some, something that they're really good at and, and, and just allowing them to thrive from that and stand on their own two feet. Uh, you would think that it is illegal to pay someone below minimum wage, but it's not. And, and I don't know why we're still talking about this. Again, if, I, if I've been in Congress for the last four years and, and my party had both, both uh, uh, you know, chambers of the, the, the uh, Congress, then and, and as well as the, uh, the executive branch, then this we would not be talking about this right now. 
we need to take care of this. And and I think all the parents on this call are, agree with me. We've got to take care of our people and 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 do what's right. Do do the things that are right, and not not just because it's easier or it's coming around, you know, election time. We need to do it right away. And this is going to be taken care of January fourth. I promise. Thanks so much. And now we'll ask the same question of Representative Spanberger. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And um, just noting that uh, these were issues in 2016, 2017, 2018, um, and they were not easy to fix issues. And when there was one party control at that time, they weren't fixed. Uh, and right now we contend with the issue of filibuster and a 60 vote threshold. Um, but there is significant unity in recognizing that people need to be paid fairly and that an 80 year old loophole in the Fair Labor Standards Act that allows employers to pay tens of thousands of disabled Americans less than minimum wage, sometimes literally pennies on the hour, is something that needs to change. And that's why I was proud to be uh, an original co-sponsor of the Rage raise the wage act. Uh, Congressman Waxton was as well. And this would ban this discriminatory practice. It would close this loophole and raise the minimum wage for all workers, not putting some cutout in there that allows the workforce to disrespect those who may have disabilities. This legislation passed the House of Representatives and we haven't been able to get a vote for it. Um, and I, I welcome any candidate here or anywhere else who may someday make it to co Congress to be clear about where they stand on closing this loophole with legislation uh, and ideally advocating to get the votes in the Senate, which we currently do not have enough to get past the filibuster. Uh, but it is heartbreaking to recognize that there are workers with disabilities who want to have the dignity of work, who want to create a bit of economic stability for themselves and their family and continue to spend decades earning less than the minimum wage without the opportunity to be treated just like the worker right next to them, without the ability uh, to gain new skills and move up in their career. Uh, this is an old, old loophole. It's 80 years old. And I am proud to have co-sponsored legislation that would do away with it. I was proud to see it pass the House. And I will continue working until we have the 60 votes we need in the Senate to actually move it forward and do away with this discriminatory practice. Thank you so much. And now being mindful of time, I think what we're going to do is do my favorite thing, a combo question. So as we give the, the candidates a chance to wrap up, we'll ask you both in your closing remarks where you can speak about anything we didn't get a chance to address tonight or anything you would like to highlight, if you can talk about how you would include the voices of people with lived experience in the work that you have going forward. That idea of nothing about us without us as you close, we would love to hear. And starting off with Representative Wexton. Thank you, Lucy, and I'd like to thank all the organizations and all the folks who joined us here today. Thank you for everything that you're doing and for your advocacy, because it's really important. There's no difference. There's no there's no substitute for that for that for that lived experience that you guys have. Now, I, I you know, as I said, my very first meeting when I got to Congress was with the little lobbyists, and that's because nothing nothing about us without us really matters to me. And I think it's very very important that we take care of the people who don't have a voice. And one of the reasons that I ran for office was because I wanted to give a voice to the voiceless. And I think I've been able to do that through my through my legislation and what I've been able to do. We have so much more to do. I think you know one of the things that we didn't even get to here is housing for for this community, which is a huge huge issue, especially here in Northern Virginia, where where housing is so so expensive. But that's one of the things I'm really proud. I serve on the housing and 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 transportation committee on on uh, in, in appropriations, and we and we passed historic investments in, in, in support of housing for people with disabilities, which I hope will actually, which I hope will actually pass the Senate and, and become a reality this year. But you know, it's very, very important that we continue to fund those programs as well, because you know, people need to stay in the communities that they're from, and we just don't have those options around here now. So I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for having me. Um, I'll continue to be an advocate for you as I have been before, and I look forward to continue to work with you in the not too distant future. Our door is always open. Please keep in touch. Thanks. Thank you so much. And now to candidate Cal, that similar question about how do we tackle that idea of nothing about us without us as you close with us tonight. Thank you so much, Lucy and uh, Sharon and Connor. Thanks for being here and everybody else also for really just making me smarter on this uh, these issues. Um, 
I think what I hear from nothing, you know, what, what you you mentioned about uh, nothing without us, and it's just that you want a voice, right? You want to be heard and, and you can't be heard if, if government shuts down, you know, like I, I didn't have the, the, the luxury of shutting down. I mean, we stopped for two weeks uh, at the very beginning of COVID, but I had to go back because I, ru- I was running operations around the world. I'd just come back from Somalia. And, and then even in the midst of COVID, I deployed to, to Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, I didn't have the luxury of saying, well, no, I, I, I'm shut down because of COVID. You want me to be there. And likewise with my wife, she's an EMT. And, and when, you know, she didn't have the the uh, the chance to to say, well, I'm not going to go on my my ambulance today because, you know, COVID. Um, and so that's what representative government is, that you have to be available to listen to your constituents. And I'm, I plan to be there for you. Um, let me just finish with this story. You know, the the redwood trees grow to about four to six hundred feet. And they sometimes range at about 15 feet in diameter. And they withstand winds, fire, you know, storms. And the most interesting thing about the redwood trees is their roots are actually pretty shallow and very short. But the reason why they're able to withstand the, the storms and the winds is because their root systems actually intertwine and they link together. And that's what we need in our community. You know, we need all these different groups like the Wheatland Farms and, and Ark of Loudoun, Ark of Virginia. We need Jill's House, all these special groups. Uh, you know, we need to push them up and allow their, their roots to intertwine. And that's what we need because one size doesn't fit all. Every parent here knows that, that what works for one parent doesn't work for another parent. One, what works for one child doesn't work for the other child. And we need this, this elaborate root system of all these great trees to allow us to grow up to, to this to, to reach the heights that we've never reached in, in our community and in, in our country. And that's why I'm here because, and that's why I'm running for Congress. I wanna make sure that we, the federal government works for we, the people, right? For we need to support, you know, parents and and and, and children like like Connor or, or like young adults like Connor so that they they can thrive. And that's what that's why I'm running for Congress, and that's what I pledge to do to you today. So thank you again for educating me and making me smart on this. And and I give you my word that I just like I did in, in the military, I've always taken care of my soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and now I will take care of you by by listening to you and, and taking care of your your most basic needs. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. And now on to Representative Spanberger. We would love to hear from you on this issue. Thank you so very much. Well, again, thank you for having me for this forum. I've appreciated the opportunity to talk about the legislative work that I have done and the community work that I have done, uh, making sure that I'm bringing the voices of constituents to the table. And for me, paramount to that is listening to families, listening to advocates, listening to individuals with disabilities who want to make their stories known uh, so that the sorts of decisions that we are making, the sorts of investments that we are making uh, take into account every perspective. It is something I do with community members across across uh, the seventh district, be it within the agriculture community, be it within uh, the law enforcement community, be it within the banking community, the list goes on and on. Um, and when it comes to issues related uh, to constituents with disabilities, it's so vitally important to look at what might be the unintended Uh, impacts or consequences of the choices that we're making. So I'll give a very specific example. Back in uh, 2021, I was heavily involved with working on and negotiating the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. In fact, uh, in the spring, uh, there was a group of us, Democrats, Republicans, senators, House members, and governors that got together to talk about how we could work towards uh, this large scale investment, historic investment in our nation. Uh, roads, bridges, infrastructure of broadband connectivity, trains, public transportation, the list goes on and on. And so I was proud to join a panel discussion of the Fredericksburg Area Metropolitan Planning Organization about the need uh, for a transit system that understands the issues of those who might have limited mobility or other disabilities. And so as we were preparing to invest billions of dollars in improving our nation's physical infrastructure, our power grid uh, and our systems 
um, I demonstrated the commitment to making sure that I was working with advocates and people with an important perspective so that when we were making choices about where to invest in our transportation uh, infrastructure or services, that we knew what it meant to make sure that that system was fully ADA compliant so that we could also ensure that we were increasing hiring, retention, and promotion of individuals with disabilities who might be filling some of the jobs of the Bipartisan Investment and Jobs Act. Um, and that's just one example. I've worked with parents across the district and, and, and certainly in the early days of COVID when the challenges were so profound, um, hearing directly from parents, directly from families uh, about the impacts they were facing and the support that they needed. It drove so much of the work that I did. It drove uh, so many of the investments and the priorities. And in fact, the flexibility that we granted under the American Rescue Plan informed by the input that I received directly from constituents. Um, I will keep working to protect the rights of disabled citizens and individuals across uh, across our community and certainly across our country. Uh, it's important that everyone have the ability uh, to live in their own home uh, and, and, and be treated and respected as the full citizen that they are. Uh, but that means making investments in programs. That means eliminating uh, some of these antiquated caps on savings. That means not limiting the type of work uh, that people can choose to do if they are able, uh, and it means recognizing the dignity of every single American. Uh, and that comes with making investments. Uh, I'm also a broad coalition builder. It's why I am proud to routinely be ranked, always be ranked as one of the most bipartisan members of Congress because these issues uh, require that we build coalitions. These issues require that we get the, subs the requisite number of votes in the House and in the Senate uh, to move these pieces of legislation forward. And so I am proud of the fact uh, that I continue to be, according to the Luger Center, the fifth most bipartisan member of Congress um, and uh, always one of the most bipartisan members of the House of Representatives because I'm focused on building the coalitions that are necessary to move this and any type of legislation forward. The jail diversion program that I mentioned, part of a larger piece of legislation, that move forward because of hard work uh, getting a coalition of people willing to support financial investments in our community and in people who need it. Uh, and we are looking at the potential of a Senate vote because of continued efforts to work to build out that coalition necessary to pass legislation in the Senate so that our bill can actually move to the president's desk, become law and impact the lives of Americans across Virginia and across the country. And so I just wanna thank all of the parents, all of the family members, all of the advocates on the line today. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for continuing uh, to be strong advocates. And Connor, uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for continuing uh, to bring your voice to uh, every discussion related to the challenges, the joys, uh, and the requirements and requests of constituents across Virginia who have disabilities and want to make their voices heard. I appreciate all your work. Thank you. And with that, perfect cue up for Connor to give us some closing remarks. I haven't had my closing remarks. Okay, I'm not sure what happened to Lucy, but yes, we go ahead and start your closing remarks. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, first and foremost, as a law enforcement officer, an elected official, and a candidate for Congress, I truly understand the importance and value of including voices from communities and organizations that are directly impacted by some of the concerns that we've mentioned here tonight. Uh, I can tell you that, that I take great pride in falling back on my record and a proven record of allowing my constituents to have a seat at the table. That is the, the, the thing that I value the most is hearing directly from my constituents, uh, because those individuals and those organizations that represent, uh, you know, the community should be the ones that have, you know, priority over anything else. And I never have, uh, you know, conversations without, you know, 
valuing first the opinion of my constituents and then taking that into consideration uh, before I cast a vote. It's my responsibility to be aware of the challenges my constituents are facing so that I can serve their needs. And I've always made that a priority and I always will make that a priority. Uh, you can find me actively engaged in community events, uh, whether it be hosting a town hall or notifying my constituents via email about anything that's happening. Uh, for me, it's always been about transparency and ensuring that my constituents feel that I am absolutely the voice and representative that they need uh, in my current capacity as supervisor here in Prince William County. Um, I've always supported organizations like the Special Olympics, even uh, before I became uh, an elected uh, official because of the work that they do uh, in the disabled community. Um, I am also incredibly proud of our department's Project Lifesaver program. Uh, it's a program that we have at the Sheriff's Office uh, where we use technology uh, to maybe locate uh, members of the disabled community that have wandered off and have become lost. And so I think it's critically important to be that bridge uh, that connects uh, with the community when it comes to resources and programs that we already have established established in our communities to ensure that everybody is in the know of what's out there, what's available for them, so that we can continue in this great partnership of ensuring uh, that we're all doing our very best uh, to adhere to the needs of members of the disabled community. I'm a firm believer that by listening, uh, learning, and uh, engaging with different groups and organizations, we've uh, been able to come up with solutions to problems that uh, not only are they facing, but uh, the ones that may come ahead. And so I am proud of the productive conversations that we've been having. I am proud uh, to allow my constituents to have the largest platform because when it's all said and done, it's not about me, right? It's about uh, loving my community and knowing that I do better because they deserve better and they deserve the very best representation. Uh, at the end of the day, our disabled community deserves to be included in everything. Uh, one of the frustrations that I've had uh, when it comes to legislators is when they're legislating on issues that they have absolutely zero knowledge on. And so for me, it's completely important uh, to have subject matter experts, uh, not just on this issue, but just issues in general to ensure that we're hearing uh, from those voices uh, who have walked in those shoes, who have lived through these experiences so that we can better be equipped with the knowledge that is needed uh, to, to, to make decisions that are uh, on, 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 on the best interest and on behalf of the people that we represent. So uh, Sharon, uh, thank you so much for your advocacy. As a mother, um, I can't say it enough. You know, my children are my biggest blessings and there is nothing this mama wouldn't do for her babies. So I want to thank you so much for all of the work that you have done. And I'm sure there's still a lot of great work for you to do because uh, moms like you are the ones that lead the charge. And also, Connor, thank you uh, for your uh, bravery, for your courage. Uh, you are a fine young man. And I'm so grateful uh, to have been a part of this discussion. And I very much look forward uh, to being your voice, your representative in Congress. So thank you so much, Lucy. Also, you were phenomenal at moderating. Uh, I've had a great time time uh, in this discussion tonight. And uh, I want to thank also uh, those that tuned in via Facebook. Uh, thank you for your time and for listening. Uh, again, this is all about you. And I look forward to being your voice and your representative. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Candidate Vega. And now, forgive me my snafu, for the second time, I will turn the microphone back over to Connor. But this time, we'll really close it up and we'll do it with style. <laughs> yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. I heard lots of facts. I hear some agreements when it comes to SSI security asset limits and the need for direct caregivers. I heard different approaches. This is our choice. This is our chance now to vote for our choice. Candidates, I thank you. I ask that you continue to listen to our stories and our needs. We all have something to say, no matter how we communicate. To give our let's pass laws and get funding so we can all live a life like yours. Nothing about us without us. Thank you very much, everyone. Beautifully said. Thank you so much to our candidates who are putting in tireless, countless hours campaigning, which we know is a rough gig. <laughs> Thank you all so much for learning with us tonight. As a reminder, Virginia's elections are November 8th, but we hold these forums at the end of August because we know many people with disabilities vote early in person or by mail or otherwise using accommodations to vote. So we're so glad you were here to learn with us tonight. As a reminder, if you have questions about voting rights, your registration, your polling location, nationwide, you can call 
our vote to ask questions anytime. Nationwide, you can also call 800-949-4232 to speak to your free local ADA center who can help you navigate voting accommodations and any other kinds of ADA accommodations you may need. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. If you register to join us live on Zoom, you will get the recording sent to you. If you're watching later on Facebook, we're so glad you found us, and we hope to see everyone at our final candidate forum in this mini-series next Monday, August 29th, when we'll feature the seats covering the Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, Falls Church area. Thank you again for your advocacy, and as a reminder, anyone who sent in questions, those questions will now be sent to our candidates so they know what's on your mind. We're so grateful for your voices. Thank you to everyone and have a great night. Bye.